recording in progress. Okay, hi everyone. Well, this is a physics project working session, and we are going to be talking about uh, multi-computation and um, uh, sort of minimal examples of that. So I just wrote this piece about the kind of multi-computational paradigm and sort of the core ideas have to do with multi-way systems and the notion that a single state doesn't have a single successor in time and kind of the foundational setup uh, wherever it is, is something more like down here where in general, you can have a collection of tokens and events. And there's sort of a minimal case of this, which I actually studied last May and I never finished this piece and I really need to finish it, which is the case with numbers where you have a multi-way system based on numbers. And I think, um, whether this is a good example, but, um, this is a multi-way system that is just based on um, 2n and n plus 1. And that's showing for states. That's showing how uh, the individual state 1 gets a 2, 2 gets a 3, and a 4, and so on. So my, my uh, so making this a little bit more elaborate, um, let me just make a version of this that shows events as well as states. What is that called? Is that called event states graph? Does anybody remember? Anybody know here? Anybody have any idea? Anybody saying anything? Um, we kind of need actual interaction here. Uh, Don't remember the name myself. Is it uh, Max? Do you remember the name? No, I don't. Well, maybe I have to just look in here and find it. Oh, for goodness sake. <sighs> Sorry. I think this will have one. Evolution events graph. Oops. Evolution, yeah. Okay, let's see. Let's just say four steps or something here. Oh, for goodness sake. So we want to say graph layout. What? Why does that happen? Is it diagram or diagram? A digraph. That's the problem. Okay. So what we see here, these are events, and they're rather trivial events in this case, right? Because they're just events that, well, I guess that what we have here is this is 2n and n plus 1. Why aren't there two events there? Do you get what I'm asking? Because there really should be two, there are two different ways that that can occur. There are two different rules there. Am I making sense? Yeah, I think it's a multi-way system that deletes 
kind of duplicate events. Right. I think there's a, an option. Um, if you do the same CC in set replace, you can actually get the token event graph, which should basically okay. look the same. Let, let's do that. I'm going to do that in just a second. Um, this is include uh, event instances. Okay. So let's just understand. Okay, so hold on a second. So this is, if I don't include event instances, Um, then, but if I do include event instances, why are there two instances there? I think it's because it does, I mean, it does the same events multiple times now. So now but why is it events. doing that? Because it never returned to the two. Why did it ever run this again? It did. It went to zero. I mean, it can go through zero any number of times. Ah, so if, for example, if I if I get rid of the zero there, oh, much better. So that means that four can get to eight. What? Why is that? Well, it looks like it's still, for some reason, the duplicate events. Just not the edges between them. What happens if you bump that one up to five instead of four? What were you expecting to see, Ed? Uh, that, that's pretty much what I was expecting. All right, let's do this in the token event graph formalism. I mean, um, but then we're going to... Um, I mean, this is a talking event graph. I mean, this. I know. Except for this events business. I know, I know, I know, I know. But I just want to walk through. So the notion is. Okay, so here's here's my plan. Okay, so we, first of all, we have. Um, finite token systems. Okay, well, actually, discrete. Yeah, I mean. Okay, we have tokens that are, okay, first of all, we have single integer tokens. That's one case where, where the tokens are just single integers. Another case, which is, is kind of the, quotes, monatomic, um, uh, you know, where, where the, those are monatomic tokens. Then we can imagine also diatomic tokens which are, you know, um, which are two integers for each token. So let's, let's look at what a diatomic system would look like. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is a monatomic system in the sense that every token has just one atom associated with it, right? And um, in this case, because we're using integers, as opposed to using like hypergraphs where the atom names don't really mean anything. This is, I mean, the important point is in an integer system, um, the atom names are, are integers, which in a sense mean something, which quotes mean something. Does that make sense to people? Whereas if we do an arbitrary hypergraph where it's just uh, labels of, of nodes that are the names of the atoms, the labels of the nodes don't, in this case, mean anything. Now, when we're when we're looking um, at, um, at, for example, the application of metamathematics, which we're hopefully going to be looking at really soon, in that case, the atoms are labeled with concepts of mathematics, so they mean something. But in, in the case of space, the atoms of space don't have distinguished names. But in this case, we do have atoms with distinguished names, which are integers. Okay, so this is a monatomic system. Let's it's also look at... an atomic state system. Important part. It's not just monatomic, also the states are atomic. 
Yes, that's correct. I mean, this is okay. So the, the okay in this system with a with a single integer for every state, we have you know single integer for every state, which is also every token, which is also every atom. Right. So this is kind of the minimal every case. state. I said that. Oh yeah. Okay. Every state, every token, every atom. This is the case where, where it's a finite. It's a, it's an explicit set that we know. That's a an enumerable set here, readily enumerable set. Okay. So that's a. So now here, we can say. Let's do the case diatomic tokens is states equals tokens still, but tokens equals two atoms. Does that make sense? So yeah. let's do a case of that. Okay, so a case of that would be here, instead of a single thing, let's see, can we do this with a, a simple function? Oh, it'll be rather nasty. Um, okay, we, we need a function of, of, of pairs. I bet I had some in my thing that I was doing a year ago over here. Um, did I have something? Uh, maybe I didn't. No, collections of integers. Here we go. I see. So in that case, what I was thinking about there was an M dot whatever. So I, I could imagine an affine transformation for every um, that would be a kind of a natural thing to do. Does that make sense to people? Yeah. And here this is a multi-way matrix system. Okay, so but in a way, um, this is just another way to give meaning to the to what is in the states, right? I mean, is, is this really diatomic in the sense, or is it still atomic, but the meaning is different from a single integer? So, so that means uh, an equivalent way. The, the question is, do you want to put the diatomicity in the syntax or in the interpretation of what uh, the, the states actually mean? Well, it's, <coughs> I mean, I guess my point is that if okay, so so hold on a second. So I, I would say is, this is still an atomic state system because there is no really any interaction between atoms. Well, hold on. I, I don't think we know what we're going to do yet. Ho okay, e.g., apply an affine transformation to uh, you know an integer affine transformation. To each, which is a generalization of my two n n plus one, right? To each uh, uh, two vector, basically. Now, wh why is that not? I mean, that that seems like it's, and so I think I may have done that over here. Um, let's see, where is my function that does that? Okay. Okay, let's copy this over here. So this was a multi-way matrix. So this was without the addition, without the affine piece. Um, and uh, what? Why are you calling that? I'm not quite sure why you're calling that. Um, Atomic state system. Yeah. Oh, because different tokens cannot interact with one another. So the fact that we split tokens into two atoms doesn't really change what the system can do. Because we can always encode it as a single integer. Well, using some, some tupling function. Sure. Yeah, so, so, I mean, so un un unless something different is done with the components of this tuple, then it doesn't, only then would it really have a separate identity. But, but this is yeah, just- so you need the interaction between tokens. 
or something like that. Make Samsung yeah. done with it, yeah. Okay, so your your point is, with a tupling function, this this sort of multi atom token system is just a you know is is just like the single atom token system yeah it, it, it's like an embedding you know you, you you're taking a one dimensional uh, subset and you're just embedding in some higher dimensional subset right and it, exactly. it happens to have more components but that's just a kind of accident in the construction it's not something uh, innately n n atomic that you're not some something that's n atomic in a distinct way right so you're saying i mean i understand what you're saying so in this case for example we could imagine uh in, in all of these we could imagine a layout i don't know what i ever did this but that was just do that hold on a second Let, let's take the nest graph version of this okay um i want to just see what it happens i did this is just now layout and um, uh, so if I say nest graph of this thing, um, let's do one comma four. Okay, great. Now my crazy idea would be, and then let's say vertex labels goes to automatic. Now here's a question. What happens if I lay this out by using the actual values of the integers to determine their X coordinates? Is that crazy? Let's try it. Let's see what this looks like. Anybody know how to do this? Because the Y coordinates I want to determine by, by essentially this causal flow. You see what I'm saying? So if I remember correctly, if you pass automatic as one of the coordinates in the vertex coordinates option, it should still work. Okay, so vertex coordinates. So what we want to say here is, well, let's just say with with g equals this thing here and then um then we say graph of g comma vertex coordinates arrow and then we want to say uh, a particular uh, vertex goes to um now what we're saying is um hash comma automatic that's what you're claiming right yeah, I'm not sure if it's supposed to rule. Oh, yeah. Okay, if you map of your X list, then it should work, yeah. Um, I don't see how I Need can... an error uh, after your X coordinates, not a minus. That's a good point. Okay. Okay, what did this do? This... If it works, actually. How could it have worked? Why isn't the one on top? Why isn't the Y coordinate? It's on the left. Down? Yeah, it is on the left. It, it worked as far as that's concerned, but... Because it's X, Y. So you, so you set the X. I know. I set the X to be the position of the one, but I wanted it to go down to two here. I want the Y coordinate to be automatic, as in to go down. Look, if, if what I do here... Here's what I can do. I can just well, that's say, not what it does. It's just well, I don't know. I know how it interacts with T graph embedding and so on. Okay, well, hold on a second. Let, let's just do this. Let's say module here and let's say E and let's say E equals graph embedding of G, right? That will give the the coordinates of all the points, right? Is that correct? Do you understand what I'm saying? Hello, everybody. Yeah, but it's what are those the, coordinates? I mean, I'm sorry. The first coordinate is x. The second is y. So you said x coordinate equal to vertex. So it goes left to right. If you want to go it from top to bottom, you just need to set the second one, not the first one. So automatic is the first one, and yeah, and the See, that's not what Steven saying. If I understand correctly, it's basically the x coordinates is correct, but the y coordinates should be as if it was a layer 
diagraph. Exactly. Included. Exactly. Which so what I want to do here is to say this is I want to do a map indexed here, um, and this is e sub um, first of hash two, comma um, y coordinate, which is two. Right, and then what I want to say here is. That's going to be a map indexed. Um, is that right? Yeah, there we go. That's right. That's what I wanted. Right. And this thing here, okay, so let's say graph layout arrow layered. Oh, there should probably just be generations and. What does that okay? Yeah, so in this case. Okay, so let's say if I go six steps here. Okay, so what I'm seeing, these are in fact multiple edges, presumably, within a single. No, the backbone is just the plus one. Uh, okay, there, there should be there are multiple edges that have been all crushed together here, correct? Right. So it's not a particularly useful picture. Um, okay, well, I want Wait to come a second, but, but it's because it's not per generation. I think that's a problem. So for example, four should be on the same layer three because it's the same generation. Okay, how do we get generations for this thing? Well, if you use set replace, you can go inside the multi history object and get them from there. All right, well, we can try doing that. But I, I just want to, the, the point that I was trying to make here is I get the point that basically these pairs, you know, up to the tupling function, which is essentially a choice of coordinates, this one to many. I mean, so this is this system is one where a single state, aka a single token, is is going to multiple tokens. That's what the every event is going one token to many tokens, right? Right? That's what's happening in this system, yes. Oh, wait a second. So I'm not sure exactly what the system does. Well, it's it's just a two matrices, right? Okay. So it, okay. So what it's doing is, okay, this is a system that maps a well, single token. It multiplies by one or the other. Yes. Yes. The maps a but single why, token. Why is it not an atomic state system? You still have, it, it's a or not an end. You're generating one vector or another vector. They're not part of a single state. Yes, yes, I know, I know. I'm just saying we can think of this. So it as doesn't use maps multiple tokens. Single it token. uses multiple states. What? No, it produces multiple tokens. Well, sure, there are event... multiple tokens, but they're in multiple states as well. That is correct. Yes, but this is a system where token equals state. Right for this system, yeah. token equals state. Okay. Right. So, but okay, it's the math. same as a number system. Is it? Well, yes, that's what we keep on saying. Right. But it's okay. not quite the same because it's differently coordinatized. Right. I mean, the labels are different, but up to a tupling function, right? Up to, uh, you know, what are they called? Um, like like um, a pairing function, tupling, you know, pairing function, right? This is so a right. pairing function will just map multiple, uh, you know, a sequence of in, a tupling function will map a sequence of integers into a single integer, right? right? And then what's happening here is that the actual update function, the event, is then some more complicated thing which might not be arithmetically representable. Am I making sense? Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the next case, 
here. So this is a one token to many tokens. The next case of interest is like two tokens to two tokens, like two to two scattering in some sense. Does that make sense? So where, while this is a one to two, one number to two, we can also consider two numbers goes to two numbers, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. So let's. So what is the? But that's a code? very different kind of thing you're doing, because now you cannot take multiple tokens at the different states as an input. What? So now you have to have multiple token states. No, you don't. No, you don't. The, the, the states are tokens. Oh, you can take multiple yeah. states as inputs simultaneously. But you can in a token a event graph. But then there are no states anymore. They're tokens, and they're part of a single state. For the uh, token system you've mentioned, is it one-to-one -one and onto? No. I mean, we could, we could consider cases where it is. That's an interesting case. That's an interesting case. The reversible case is an interesting case, but that's a different thing. Okay, let's let's. And my point is, when you say two multiple tokens, you are not saying complete information, because it's either multiple tokens of a single state or multiple states. Max, that's very the important. packaging of tokens into states. Look, there's two levels of how these systems get interpreted. Okay, so I mean, let, let's talk about the two to two. token case okay so you know levels of interpretation of these systems you know there's 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 potentially atoms there's tokens there's states and there's foliations well, i don't know what the right what is a single slice in a foliation transversals is that what they're called Sure. Another slice. I see. So you, I see. So if I understand correctly, your point is if we operate on event sets, we don't even need states at all. So we just have atoms and tokens. Yes. Okay, that's a good point. State right. is like sem semantic for the tokens. How you bind the states are like the semantics of the tokens. Yes, that's yeah. right. Right. Um, and then foliation slices is the semantic for the states. Say that again. What's next? And transversals or foliation slices are semantic for the states, how you bunch them up. Exactly. What's exactly. going to be the next one? Well, I think we need states category for foliations. That's a higher. Token event growth directly. Say it again. Well, I don't think we need states for foliations. Especially no, for but, I mean, history cases, for example. We don't. But the, 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 look, the way we're doing this is, you're right, that the lowest level, you can think of atoms plus tokens. Atoms to tokens is kind of like, I hate this syntax-semantics distinction, but anyway, it's kind of like syntax. Others uh, above is like semantics, but I hate this. I mean, I just hate that distinction because it's, it's like, but, but it's if you are doing event sets only, then we don't need states. But as soon as we start with multi histories, we do need states only if you want to interpret the multi histories like that. You can have so a if you want to generate multi histories, event sets don't tell us what will happen if you start from a particular initial state. Well, I'm not quite understanding that, but let's go through this in a bit more detail. Okay, so let's look at your, we're going to use your um, uh, code here, Max. Sure. Ooh, I hate this, but okay, let's go ahead and do this. Really, really, really don't like this, but, and somebody has got to remind well, me at the, end of this, at the end of this meeting, version. at the end of this meeting, somebody has got to remind me to undo this. Okay. All right, so let's do the original numbers system with this. Do you understand what I'm saying? This system here, I want to do that with this. How do I do it? Yeah. 
So you can do generate full event set. Okay. And then it's a multi cell substitution system. Just tell me what to type. A multi cell substitution system. And okay. then the list of rules. Just tell me what to n, type. N underscore goes to 2n as the first rule. Well, this is the rule delayed because there's n on the right hand side. And then goes 10 plus 1. Okay. And then if I remember correctly, the second argument is the number of generations. Second argument of what? As a single number to generate full event set. Yeah, so multi substitution system is the system. Yeah, and no. then you need to pass to its initial state. So this is an operator. I need to pass the initial set of tokens to it. Just went off into la la land. What's it doing? Okay, if we can't get this to work, we're just going to use the code that I've written for this. C can we get this to work? I mean, this seems like a very basic thing. What, what, what happened here? Maybe it would help to say n underscore integer here. Would that help? Oh, actually, I think what happened is that you probably have version 13. And it doesn't okay, know how to detect Max, patterns in version 13. Just tell me what I need. Okay, so you will have to specify the size of. Wait, Wait okay. What yeah, version do all, I need? This a list. This needs to be a list of tokens. So both the size of the rule needs to be in a list. Okay. Yeah, maybe that will fix it. Nope. Okay. What else do I need? Otherwise, I'm going to have to. We're going to have to write the code ourselves. What? What else? What? What else can we try here? Can you try running this, please? Seems like a very basic case. Well, we'll have to use chain multi history. Just which is okay. more explicit. Oh, it's an old syntax. I don't remember it. Oops, I my hand. Well, so why don't I run the new syntax? Because it doesn't support the event sets yet. Well, then, just... I don't okay, know let me just mean. try it myself first. I'll send you the code. For it. Okay. Okay. You know what? I want to write my own code for this. Okay, so I had started doing that. Um, let me just pull it up. Um, So this was what I was trying to do. So here is, this takes a list of tokens and returns a list of tokens, right? And let's take a look at this code then. What is this doing? Oh, I see. What this is doing, by the way, we could run this. And, and by the way, Max, I mean, this is why I can't just can't stand the level of un, you know, whatever. This is not a complicated piece of code. Does I mean, it has nothing to do with 
key to where it is. It's just because it's an unstable branch, so it doesn't work correctly. Yet. Well, whatever. And because it didn't let me have the damn work on it, it's not complete yet. Okay. Okay, so this is, for example, the M plus N and minus M system. I don't know if it's correct. Um, take a look. Three, four. And I'm indicating, I don't even know what I'm indicating in these events here. Oh, I see. That's event of type one. That's what I was doing there. So let, let's say, <clears throat> let's just say I do this. Then I should make... Yeah, is this right? One, two goes to three. Negative one. Is that negative one? Yeah, but why isn't that? Oh, I see. What, what one plus doing two is, is one consumed... plus two is three. No, 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 no I know, but it, it, one. it consumed yeah. those tokens, which means those tokens aren't around anymore. So we could do a more complicated thing here by saying by leaving those tokens around. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. okay. So okay. that yeah. then they're still there. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um. Okay. Minus one one. I mean, it, it's ordering them a little bit peculiarly, but that's basically. Right. So is this, wait a minute, is, is there, there's no single history, multi-history thing. This is all possible. This is doing all possible histories, right? Or am I confused? Maybe Max can identify that. I'm not sure what it's doing because you start with two tokens and then it produces. Oh, wait a second. Please, it's four tokens. Okay, which is actually correct. Right. So, what it's yeah, doing. Yeah, except then. there is no. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, one, two, three, minus one. Yeah, it just doesn't deduplicate. Right, I think that's what the unique tokens thing is doing. Right, so I think if I say false there. Mm. So does it produce it a multi-history on event set? Well, it seems to be not producing. Okay, that's the deduplicated case. Right? Yeah, it appears so. Okay, so what this is doing, let's consider this case here. No, I would say it's not doing all possible histories, right? Because if it was all possible histories, we would see from those four things, we would see, uh, you know, four choose two cases, right? Am I making sense? Mm. Oh, yeah, that's just a saying? single history. Yes, right. right. So it's it's doing, but what we need is the multiple history it, version. I think of this. it overlaps true because. It oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. This is a single history because overlaps is false. Okay, so here, I see. So let me go the overlaps true case here. I don't think it's going to make any difference in that case. Do you agree with me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, but now, if on the other hand, we have NM here, let me not live as dangerously as to do that. Let me go to just three steps. Overlaps false. No, I'm sorry, that's overlaps true. true. Okay, this is producing some immensely complicated creature. Let's just do two steps. Okay, that's more like it. So then one, two, that's a single way of combining one, two, 
But here, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, four choose two events, which can mm -hmm. occur, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I say unique tokens false, this will now be the deduplicated multi-history thing. Is that right? Yeah. I believe yeah. that's right. Yeah. I mean, assuming my code is correct, which is kind of miraculous if it's correct, because it's not very complicated here. I read for oh. it. It seems correct. What's that? I read this code. It seems okay. correct. I have a, a, a little bit cleaner version of it. Oh. But I haven't changed I would how love it to works. See the, I, I would love to see the cleaner version. If you could send that along. Okay, but hold on. Let's let's just do, um, I'm just curious what this thing builds up to. If I say simple graph of this, why is simple graph, oh, I see, because it's a directed. If I say undirected graph, okay, so now, if I go, let's say three steps. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a complicated mess. And then let's go ahead and say aspect ratio. Okay, what is that object? I don't know what this is. Ed, do you recognize this as anything in particular? No, I was just looking at that, seeing if I could figure it out. I mean, what it's what it should be doing is this is so when when Max talks about an event set, basically this is the set of numbers where this event. I'm actually very confused. Why does that event there? Oh, it doesn't have two inputs because those were actually both ones and I simple graphed it. So it really does have two inputs. We just don't see that here. Making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. there's no Z. Ah, yeah, I know. Go ahead. <laughs> I just couldn't find the zero. Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's over here. All right. So, so now, what is this? So, this is a thing where this is essentially an events and tokens graph. Okay. So let, let's let's just do a little bit of a study of the two to two. Assuming my code is correct, of two to two systems. Okay. For example, we could do two to two systems on a finite alphabet. Okay, so th this would be overlaps true. So this is the thing. So then we would say, okay, um, you know, two to two on finite alphabet. So you, you understand what I mean here. So so let's parameterize this. So this is. Uh, this is of the form A, B goes to C, D, correct? And what we want to do is for a finite alphabet, A goes from zero to, to you know, K minus one, et cetera. We want all possible such permutations. Am I making sense? Ed, this is your kind of thing. How do we generate those? I'm not totally sure, but I'd look at the counts. Okay, look, look, what we're saying is for every one of these, and by the way, these are these are orderless, right? So we want we want all cases of this with each of the atoms being from zero to k minus one. Okay. So what this is then. Uh, let me think about this for a second. I mean, other than the orderlessness thing, right? What we're enumerating is 
The trivial enumeration of this is two poles. Wait a minute. What we're looking for is a set of maps. Okay, so there's there's th two things we can have. Either a given AB can have a mapping, or it can be in the language of, of an automata, or it can be an epsilon move, right? For people who remember what those are, right? Which just means a thing which doesn't have a destination, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. If uh, A, B, and C, D are exclusive, you get odd graphs. What is an odd graph? Um, for example, if uh, one, two is on one side, you couldn't have one or two on the other side. So one, two could go to three, four, but not to one, four. I see. Okay, but, but let's just enumerate these possible cases, okay? And then, then we can just see what they do, right? Could, help me, please. I mean, so, so what we've got is... Um, each, so each pair, right? What is a canonical representation of every pair, right? Given it's, it's zero k minus one, we can we can just say every pair. So all we do, yeah, this is very straightforward. Okay, so consider represent each pair by uh, the from digits of sort of the pair comma k, correct? Do you understand what I'm saying? Come on, guys, you're not this slow. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, yeah you're basically enumerating say the dominoes. Yes, yes. So all I've got to do then is that from digits, those are numbers from IE, numbers from zero, to, uh, come on, guys! Please, please, please! I mean, you, you can do this. This is this is to uh, k squared minus one. Is that true? What's the largest number you can get here? You can get k minus one, k minus one, where the integer digit from digits of that is in base k is otherwise known as k squared minus one, right? Yes. Okay, so what we've got is numbers from zero to k squared minus one, and we've got four such. We've got two such numbers. We've got mappings. What we're doing is we're saying for those numbers. So let's let's take an explicit example, uh, zero to three, for example. Okay, so we've got range zero to three. Okay, so for each one of those numbers, we are we are defining a mapping from that set to itself, right? Otherwise known as a permutation. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what we need is permutations of that. Okay. Those are the possible rules, I believe. Okay. Let's unpack one of those. Um, oh, no, 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 no. They don't have to be permutations. The reversible ones are the permutations. Right. Because for each one of these, we need to find these are the reversible, these are the bijections. Right? Does this make sense to people? Hey, can, come on, pay attention. Say something, please. No, yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So, in general, what, but the, the all mappings would be uh, just, um, the tuples of range zero three, right? Tuples, I'm sorry, what do I mean by that? I mean tuples comma four of that, right? Those are all the mappings. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. All right, so now mm -hmm. let's, let's take one of the mappings and unpack it, okay? okay? So mm -hmm. unpack mapping takes that list and takes a k value, 
and turns that into something which is going to look like this rule here. But actually, the rule is going to be it's going to be a list of rules for integers, right? So let's take a mapping like 0, 3, 1, 2, 3 here. So then what we want to do is we're going to be saying the left-hand side is range 0, k minus 1. Um, and that's going to be uh, goes to list. And then we're going to thread that. And then for those, we're going to do a... Um, uh, we're going to say map integer digits hash comma k um, onto this at level two. Do we believe this? So let's try unpack mapping of let's say zero two one three at wait a minute, this isn't right. This is k squared minus one. Ah, ah, okay. This needs to be comma two. Okay, there we go. So that's our mapping. Do you agree? Now, there's something screwy about this because that mapping, did I get this right? Because those two should be equivalent. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Oh, you could you could apply sort or not. Oh, right, 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 right. So here, I should be doing, in my integer digits, I could also be doing a sort on the integer digits there. And then I could be doing a delete duplicates on the whole thing, or a union of the whole thing, right? Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe. Yes. Okay, so that's telling me for my bijections. Okay, so here I could generate these. So let, let's take this one as an example, right? What initial state should I use for this? Zero, zero. Oh. Oh, well, this one is trivial. It doesn't do anything. Well, yeah, okay, it's the identity rule. Okay, we're well, fine. But, but I mean, so let's let's try. Okay, so let, let's go unpack mapping onto all of those permutations. One fifty three. Um, onto permutations of range zero three, and then let's say a union of that whole thing. Okay. So let's take these and use those as the rules here. And what do you think? I should start with zero, zero? What do you think? Why are these numbers? Oh, yeah, that's k equals two, right? So those numbers are all so like that. Starting from zero, zero doesn't change anything from, I mean, the zeros are the same, so they get duplicated anyway. So you think I should start zero one and get all the events in one generation? Okay, you don't need two so generations; it's one generation. It gets the other thing because you already enumerated all the tokens. Well, so here, this is unique tokens to true, but if I say unique tokens to false. This is with unique tokens, right? Does that make sense? Do, do, do you understand what I'm doing here? Yeah, so we destroy it each time. Okay. What, what do you mean? I mean, the, the tokens get destroyed after each application. Yes, that's a way to think about it. One uh, related topic you might make a note on is church bell ringing, since we're doing pairs. 
and no doubt we'll end up with bell numbers. Um, no, but okay, hold, hold on, hold on. What we're trying to understand is finite set token event graphs, okay? So Max made a comment that with a finite set, you know, with a finite set, we always see, well, we may or may not see all events after one step. We do. If you, if you start from all these tokens. No, we, we can see, see all events after one. But, but, I mean, it's true for any set. It's just, you know, for finite set, we can, it, it takes only a finite number of initial, finite amount of data in the initial condition to see every possible event after one step. No, but the point is here we don't need to discover new tokens, whereas usually we do. Like I if understand. You take a that. Model, we, there is no way we can obtain all the possible tokens without running the system. Yes, I understand. I understand. But, but, well, actually, is that true? I mean, if we just symbolically, in a standard Wolfram model hypergraph system, if we just symbolically write down the atoms, why are we not getting all the all the states, all the events, basically, all the tokens? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, if you really write all of them, then sure. No, but what do you? And no, then no, it's no. true for any system because you just write all possible expressions. I understand, but there's nothing. But once you've got a thing that says x, y, x, z goes to whatever, right? It doesn't know what the level of the individual events. I could call x and y one, two, three, four, or whatever. And that's equivalent to something that's seven, eight, nine, ten, or something like that. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Sure. So if you just look at because the events. How, set, many of them need. how many watts? Well, if you start from say one, two, two, three, three, four, and then you collapse neighboring edges, then you can only get tokens which are you know sorted pairs of numbers. But in order to realize that that's all the tokens you get, you need to run the system. I mean, you can of course start with all possible pairs of numbers, but then you have a lot of tokens which you don't care about at all. Right, I understand, I understand, I understand. With a finite set, one can explicitly enumerate all possible tokens. We understand that. But now what we're asking for is a slightly different thing because we're asking, so what can you say about kind of the repeatingness? So in other words, in the deduplicated graph, starting with any given set of tokens, the maximum distance. I mean, there's a finite, there's a finite automaton, isn't there? That you go through. I mean, in other words, is it the case that in this case the Petri net effectively turns into a finite automaton? I think so. Can we walk through that, please? So, in other words, what this is saying is, at every So, in other words, the usual thing where you have multiple markers. Max, it, could, do you understand this? It is a final Petronet. I'm sorry? I mean, it is a final Petronet. No, but in this or case, finite. a finite Petronet. Yeah. Most Petronets are finite that people consider. Right, I consider them Nestor graphs. What? Uh, Knesser, uh, K N E S E R. What are those? Uh, those are graphs that basically deal with pairs like this. Okay. Do we, I mean, can I see some? Are they, are they like in the oh, wild? Sure. Um, I'll post a link. Do we have them in, in graph data? Yes.
Okay. Which one should I look at? Uh, the first one. Seven two. Yeah. What do the seven and the two mean? It uh, means that there's a total of uh, seven uh, integers, and they're being done in pairs. All right, well, let me try something smaller. Boring. So wait a minute. If I label this, I'm not sure if they'll show the pairs um, on this level. You're saying it will just be, it will just say one, two, three, four. That's boring. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what this is then, so how is this graph generated? Uh, these are mutually exclusive uh, pairs. And it gets interesting once the, the number of digits is greater than four. Mutually exclusive pairs, exclusive so, so if I did this by hand, what would how how would I generate this graph myself? Uh, you would uh, say all the numbers, uh, all the pairs from zero zero to four, and then anything that didn't have a duplication between the two pairs would be a connection. And I think five is the Peterson graph. Okay, well, hold on, hold on. So what you're saying, if I say, for example, range of four here, tuples. Uh, do, do, do five instead. Okay. okay, all right. So I have all... And uh, subsets instead. Why am I doing subsets? Um, in I these cases... You, right, in these cases, you don't, um, you don't use duplicate values. And this, this kind of came out of church bell ringing. You can't ring the same bell twice at the same time. Okay, so there, there we have this. And then are those the nodes? Uh, yes. Okay, so then we have and a you'd graph. And you'd want to do two. You'd want to do subsets of size two. And there's uh, 10 of them and uh, the connection between them that basically makes the Peterson graph. I see, I see, I see, I see. So there's subsets of size two. And then what we're doing is we're asking for each one of those subsets, for, we will make a graph how do we do this? There's a nice right. You can nice do graph. subsets, subsets two again, and then find all that if you flatten. Oh, wait a minute. There's a, there's a way can... to do this with graphs. It's what it, it's not nearest neighbor graph. What is it? It's a graph where you can test the criteria for connectedness. You see what right. I'm and you'd want you'd basically want zero connectedness. No, no, I, I understand, but I'm asking. I'm asking. Wait a minute. You join them when they do not have any overlap. Is that correct? Right. Correct. Okay, but what is the analog of nearest neighbor graph? Um, there's another graph. To, there's another way of generating graphs that is a bit like that, that I think does what we want. Um, yes, um, I can't remember what those graphs are. Well, but what? Basically, we're going to make an edge list. What is it? Relation graph. Data and a binary relation. Is that the one? I think so, yes. Okay, so let's see. Um, whenever f of this is true, okay? So this should be, we're then saying relation graph of that function. So what is the function? So this is the... This is the any. Okay. Is it just literally contains any here? Add your comments. I'm not sure what that graph is. Well, I know, but is contains any what we want? We, oh, I don't think so. Not for the Peterson graph. No, Ed, the definition of the Knesset graph thing. What are we trying to do? Oh, mutual okay. exclusive. Okay, so what's the function which tells us, how do we tell whether the two elements here are mutually exclusive? We say, is it some unsame Q type thing? What, what is the test for mutual, ex mutual exclusion? That, 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 but yeah, isn't it just some intersection? Yeah, it's just intersection is, is, is null, right? Intersection of hash one comma hash two 
um, equals equals null, right? Yes. Uh huh. Or just contains none. <laughs> Is that right? Does that yes, take... and and that's the and that's the Peterson graph there. Why doesn't it look for better? Is there a, I mean, so okay? So if I say isomorphic graph Q of that comma, um, graph data Peterson graph. Is that how it's spelled? Yes. What we do, it'll do. Okay, and you can tell by looking at that that's the Peterson graph. I cannot. Um, okay, so you're saying that. So if I if I try the next case up. If I try six here, and then I say um, vertex labels, OK, so this will have the property that two things are joined, yes, if they're mutually exclusive. OK, I right. get it. OK, now what does that have to do with what we were doing before? Well, this is um, the graph of church bell ringers. OK. We're somewhere in the middle of token event graphs. There are no church bells. Ringing. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. What does this have to do with the token event graph thing? What does it have to do with this? Um, a rule through uh, patterns um, is basically what the church bell association has been looking for for 500 years. So, so basically any rule that goes through everything is something that's of interest to them. So basically these token graphs are other ways of let's map out everything and see where the more interesting paths are. Okay. So your point is, I see. Okay. So the claim is if, you know, does the TEG, uh, you know, ring bells in all possible permutations. Mm -hmm. Or just a subset. If you once you understand how all the rules work, then you've then you figured out a okay. set of a given but, but, size. But, but so so the thing we were trying to do is we're trying to characterize what happens with these uh, token event graphs and so on for okay for a finite set. What can we say? about what will happen in the token event graph and then what will happen in the states graph and so on, right? That's, that's the question we have before us, right? In a finite set, right? So the first question is what do the deduplicated, right? What do the deduplicated graphs look like for, okay. These are deduplicated graphs. And is it obvious what these are going to look like? Starting from zero one, is that enough to start? Yes, it must be enough to start from. Is it enough to start from zero one, guys? Well, we only I... have zero and one. What else do we want to start from? Well, the problem is that it might be that zero zero generates something. Well, the event sets zero zero is the same as a single zero. They're sets, not multi-sets. I see what you're saying. Okay, so starting from zero, one. And also, you don't need two generations. One is sufficient, as we talked about. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's enough because events are just picking subsets of zero one, right? Okay, so your claim is that here, if I just go one step, well, I'm not seeing that. I don't understand that. Well, that means your code must be wrong. <sighs> okay. Wait, I think it's wrong because it has duplicate events in it. Like if you look at the first graph in the previous output, these two events are actually identical. So there shouldn't be two of them. 
Well, I think I'm just deduplicating tokens, not deduplicating events. Well, if you're generating the event set, then it's wrong because it shouldn't. I'm not. I, who said I was generating the event events. set? I'm doing what I said I was doing, which is I'm evolving it and I'm deduplicating tokens. Right? That's all I said I was doing. But you're not evolving it because then you wouldn't. Well, if, you, if you're evolving it, then it wouldn't be when it would be multi history, in which case putting zero, zero would matter. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking, right? So, in fact, this is wrong, right? So, okay, can you unconfuse for a second? What do we need to do? In the initial state, you're saying, let's say I start with zero, zero. Okay, I get different results, right? Because well, I am start doing from it. one. I'm sorry. There's no one. What if you start is it from zero zero one? Okay, we can try that. Okay, and the comparison of that. So that's yet a different thing. So, but if we just try zero zero one one, I think it'll again be different. But if we did five, I bet it won't be different. What if you start from a single zero? We did that. Oh, a single what zero. What happens? Yeah. Because if, if zero, you're we'll generating multi history, yes, it we'll should do nothing. Do nothing. Okay, so yes, yeah, so these are multi histories. Right, so let's let's review what's happening here. So this is at every event. Why do you think that, okay, so this is two steps, but why do you think one step is enough? I don't think it's enough. No, it's not enough for multi-history. Because you would just get more and more duplicate events with more generations. Right. I mean, the events, look, we could just draw out what the events are. Okay, so, so one question is, you know, one issue is... Um, what is the relationship between events? That's effectively the event set. But it's really the event graph, basically an event graph, right? Which makes some sense in this case because we're saying, given an event, let's see, what is that graph? The graph has, it always has two inputs. No, because a token, okay, do, do, do you see what I'm talking about here? Well, it's still a token event graph. It's just of a different structure. Right, we're saying, I'm saying that if we look at a set of events, a set of possible events, right, let's take, um, let's take these. Maybe the confusion is that you like forgetting how you're generating this graph because you like generating pair of edges each time. So for each token on the left and on the right, you have a pair of edges to the event and out of it. Right. So maybe that's the reason for more edges than, it's, than it should be. Well, well I was how... confused because I thought it, this was doing the same as generate full event set, which it doesn't at all. And so there's no yeah, sense. There's no there's just generation of pages, just putting them in the, in the graph. Well, it generates a multi-history, if I understand correctly. So it only generates the events that are achievable from the initial state. Sorry. OK, look, the point is, this is not the thing we're generating here is not a, a a a states graph right it's a it's well, a, obviously right and there isn't the question is is there an analog of the states graph for the case where there is a one to many mapping there is an obvious states graph to make for the case of a two to two mapping 
There isn't an obvious statescraft to make, is there? Well, it's exactly the same. So I think the an analog of a statescraft is the event set. And event set for one to two and for two to two is exactly the same. What is an event set? Well, it's a set of all possible events. Knitted together by what their inputs and outputs are, right? Well, that would be a token event graph of the event set. No, look, the event set, this is the event set, right? This is an event set, is it not? That there. I think so. Is a collection of events. Okay, how do you make a graph out of this? Well, it is already a directed hypergraph. So you're yeah, saying. Exactly as written. So you just need, no, hypergraph. Well, it's also a graph. Is, no, is the because, you're talking because about? the vertices here are zero and one, not the pairs. So it's a directed hypergraph. Okay, so we can we can then we should be able to draw draw that, right? Is that not correct? No, Wolfram model plot only plots um, uh, only plots ordered hypergraphs, not directed ones. What's the difference between an ordered hypergraph and a directed hypergraph? So okay, so ordered hypergraph. Is where edges are ordered lists of of something of mm -hmm. vertices. Directed hypergraph is a graph where edges are pairs, which each side is unordered, but the pair itself has a direction. So it's basically a set goes to set. And why is it talking about graphs this... in particular? Directed hypergraphs. But, but why isn't that the same as this graph here? Isn't this graph that? Because the vertices should be zero and one. The edges here have four, you know, four things, two go in, two go out. You're saying one, one goes to zero, one, but you're saying I should break that down into something more atomic. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so so, so just the by normal, hand. So the usual way to draw this directed hypergraphs is by turning them into bipartite graph, which is token event graph. Okay, again, can can you walk through for me what? Okay, so in other words, where that goes to, so I could draw that if I wanted to by just saying for every one of those, I could just put in a you know, goes to E, an event, right? This yeah. is E1, and then E1 goes to that. That goes to E2, and exactly. E2 goes to that, right? Yeah. That goes to E3. And E3. you need to thread it. So. Mark okay. the thread of all of this. Yeah, okay. Okay, hold on. E4, E4 goes to that. Okay. So wait a minute. I, I could actually make this as a graph as well. And then I could do the threaded version. Well, that's still a, a stage graph, not a, an event graph. I understand. But, but so this is... Okay, so that now looks very much like our evolution events graph, right? Exactly. So now, Cartinate. Yeah. Okay, now what the so heck this is This is a token this? event graph of the event set. A token event graph. Let me understand that here for a second. Um, we should have invited Tally to join us here. Tally is, is making various comments on the live stream. Um,
Okay, so hold on, hold on. Let me let me understand what this is. I'm still a little bit confused here. So you're saying, is, is there a better way to draw this graph that we could understand what it is a bit better? The, the, you're saying oh, this you is you the token the event graph. Correctly. Yeah, you're correct. saying this is the token event graph of, c can we do that actually with the colors? Is there an easy way to do that by saying vertex style goes to pattern Goes to sure, we just need different heads for events and tokens. Well, why don't we just do symbol? We have that actually. One of them is symbol, one of them is an integer. Arrow sure. symbol goes to blue. Arrow, no, actually, arrow symbol goes to, to orange. Arrow integer goes to blue. Well, you can just use Wolf, Wolf and Physics project style data and get the exactly correct ones. I know. But, but but this is a good approximation. Okay, so what on earth is going on here? Okay, so this is a deduplicated token event graph. I know what's confusing about it. I mean, look at each event separately. So like E1, for example, it takes two zeros as an input and two ones as an output. Right, well, that's let's, exactly let's what the look graph at... shows. Let's just look at the E1. Okay, two zeros as input, goes to an E1, goes to a single one, goes to two ones. Yeah. Okay. So for example, let's take the E2 section. So you're saying that this thing here is simply the knitting together. I mean, if I were to take this, uh, let's see, each one of these is how many elements? Four elements, right? So if I say um, partition that, comma four, and then I say. Well, that's the inverse of catenate, I think. I mean, the inverse of catenate. Partition four. Well, whatever. It means really just to rem I, I... remove catenate. It's going to be the same. You think so? I don't believe that's correct. If you want to draw each of the events, oh, okay. Yeah, that would be two, not four. No man. Okay, so there are the events, right, in this case. This is saying E2, the event E2, which we're seeing up here. So let's remind ourselves here. The event, so we could label the edges by events here, right? Do you know how to label the edges? Anybody know how to do that? Page labels. Okay, so let's do this. So then we would say here, edge style. Okay. Well, actually, edge labels goes to E1, E2, E3, E4, correct? Why the heck is it just labeling those all with E4? I think it needs to be a, a list of rules. Okay, so then we map onto this. We basically thread this thing arrow that. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, we have another stupid thing here, which if we've got to take these, we've got to do that thread, and then we've got to do slash dot that goes to directed edge. But it works already. What do you mean? Oh, did it do it right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. OK, so this is saying E1 goes there. OK, so then the dual of that graph is basically this 
the dual of that graph is this thing here. Is that correct? Maybe and then by dual line graph. What is it called? Line graph, I think. There is a what is line graph. All the edges become connections if they're share a vertex. So where is this? So you're saying in this graph here, what are you saying? You're saying I could take this graph here and I could say line graph of that. Is that right? Uh, no. It's, it's not different. It's subset of the. It's the, the incidence with, with graph. The Tally says it's the incidence graph. That's from the incidence set of these things, but I don't think it works from a graph, does it? It's confused. I think it needs to break those apart there. Okay, but we, we I think we more or less understand for this finite set. Okay. What? Okay, for a finite set, what is the most complicated kind of multi-way? Okay, we're, we're, this is always a finite graph. The, okay, the... Okay, what, I'm, I'm confused here. This event set graph is always a finite graph, obviously, because there are only a finite number. You know, the event set. What are we calling this graph? It's the deduplicated. It's kind of the event knitting graph. Um, it's how the events get knitted together by their atoms, right? i.e. how the events are, how the pos how possible events are connected by atoms right so is that right this thing is always what do you mean by atoms you mean by tokens Is the event yes. meeting graph yes. a token yes. event graph? Yes. It's not a token event graph. It's a deduplicated token event graph. Well, it's still a token event graph. It's a graph of tokens and events, okay. just okay. not okay. of a multi history, but of an event set. Confusing. Okay. So, anyway, this is how possible events are connected by tokens, right? That's what this is saying. So now the question that I'm asking is, if we look at, okay, if we've got a finite set of rules, if we've only got one event, for example. Oh, I see. The, the, the question is, this is really every instance of every event with every specific set of tokens, correct, occurs in this graph. It's not just every event. So, for example, if we have an event that takes A, B to A minus B, A plus B, right, that's not a single event in this graph, is it? It's, it's an event. There's a, one event in this graph for every A, B, A and value of A and B. Is that correct? Hi. Um, I'm joining the, the live stream. Oh, okay, a little great. Bit late. Hello there. Um, this is actually i'm really glad you guys are talking about this because um this has been something i've been thinking about for quite a long time so i even have a suggested name for this um so just to recap something the token event graph which you've already looked at now mm -hmm. um the claim is it's a bipartite graph right there's tokens there's events those are two different kinds of vertex Yep. And the one only connects to the other and vice versa. That's the incidence graph of a hypergraph. Incidence graph meaning that um, 
the events are really hyper edges, right? Because they consume multiple tokens and they produce multiple tokens. That's a hypergraph. I see. I see what you're saying. Okay. So, so you're saying hypergraph. the token event graph can be, is either a bipartite ordinary graph with explicit nodes for, for events or is a hypergraph with essentially bipartite edges, with bipartite hyperedges? Um, I would modify that. I would say that it's a kind of hypergraph that's not the same kind of hypergraph. Well, I'll clarify what that means, right? So in um, the hypergraph rewriting system, in, in Wolfram models, um, a hyperedge is just a list, an ordered yep. list, right? But that's the not not the only way of making hypergraphs. Sure. Um, I mean, there are many different data structures which could be, you know, in in general there are many um, the um, you know, in general many possible data structures which could be the hyperedges. Correct. So um, Max and I did a survey of these at one point. And here's some examples. Um, it's, it's a good way to think about it is actually with type theory, because the fundament, whatever those hyper edges are, there's some kind of data structure whose leaves are going to be vertices, right? So, yes. so the bottom of whatever that type is, it's some kind of compound type, and the bottom is going to be vertex. And Wolfram models, the hyper edges are just list. Right, exactly. So it's a list of vertex. But another one would be set of vertex. Right, which is an unordered a, hypergraph. Which is what some people call an unordered hypergraph, yes. But now, if you make it not just one layer deep, that type, if you make it two layers deep, yes. then you can start talking about directed and undirected. And that's a completely orthogonal axis. So if you go to the Wikipedia page for hypergraphs, it's all a confusing mess because people haven't really been systematic and thinking about how to construct that data structure for hyper edges. And if you take a type theory point of view, it's sort of obvious what it is. So talking about directed versus undirected, that's really saying, um, what are we going to make? What are we going to wrap? We've got list or we've got set of vertices, but now we're going to wrap that in something else. So we're going to have um, a rule from set to set or from list to list that would be directed. Or we're going to have a two-way rule from list to list or set to set or whatever, and that would be undirected. I don't understand why you don't think of it as nested lists and sets. That is, you could have a, a list of two sets, for example, a set of, you know what I'm well, saying? Well, no, a, a two list of, of lists. That would be a directed, ordered hypergraph, a pair of lists of vertices, right? You agree yes. that that's yes. a directed hyper, yes. directed ordered hypergraph. Yep. And then your point would be if you switch that pair for just a, a set that's got two elements in it, that doesn't quite work because it stops you having an undirected edge, an undirected hyper edge from a set of vertices to itself because that would just collapse. I see. If it was a pure set, I, I get it. Okay. So, but you're saying you can make a I mean, it's clear you can make a hierarchy of data structures because one data structure that I want for these things is expressions. Yes, and that's totally, that's a completely, yeah, in fact, the type theoretic way of looking at it is then quite natural because what that'll say is that the atoms of a tree are the vertices and everything else is part of the hyper edge. That would be one way to, to, think about expressions as hyper -graphs. Yes, 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 right. So, I mean, expressions as hyper edges, um, you know, the essentially the atoms slash symbols, aka symbols, aka symbols, etc. symbols, integers, etc. The atoms are atoms, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, the, then, did I misspell? Yeah, I did misspell this. Um, 
it would be upsetting if I spell check it didn't have hyper. That's by the way not the coincidence. That's exactly why atoms like called atoms. You mean by Democritus? I don't think. No, no, no. Instead, no, by Max. Yes. <laughs> yeah, which I've oh, okay. been trying to explain okay, this before back. the physics project launch. Yeah. Um. Okay, but the reason that I'm interested in hyper -edge, expressions as hyper edges is because my model of metamathematics involves every mathematical statement as a hyper edge. And the state of mathematics is a hypergraph that is the knitting together of all the hyper edges that represent these statements of mathematics. If that made any sense. Tal, did that make sense to you? Well, it sounds like. It could make sense, but maybe we need more details. Well, right. I mean, we're actually going to try and pick up all the actual uh, statements of mathematics from these formalized math systems and try and actually build that hypergraph. Um, but I mean, the, the thing is, I, I would claim this is the most general case. Well, probably. I don't know. Is it the most general case? Expressions as well, hyperedges with, with, with attributes like orderless as ne needed. Oh, yes. I was just about to object that because we don't have, well, we don't have a set structure. Right. Although you can if create one. If like set and multi-set, then we'd be off to the races. I know. One day. Um, but I mean, we can clearly synthesize that by setting something to be orderless. Um, okay. Here's a question for you guys. In, in all this setup, how do causal graphs relate? To the, I mean, a token event graph, basically, the causal graph from a token event graph is a causal hypergraph, is it not? Well, so that, that's actually my proposed name. So token event graphs are the one way of representing this idea of tracking all the local event dependencies, right? Um, and my, the name I was going to propose for the Incidence version of that, which is a hypergraph, is the causal hypergraph. I think that's the right name. The causal, okay. The only little problem is that in the causal graph, vertices are events, not tokens. Even the both of them would represent causality. The causal graph was named too soon. I think that was the problem. Um, because it's just one information losing slice of the causal hypergraph. It's where you you kind of um well, th this is the okay there's a question of causal hypergraph is the the set of events a hyper edge in the causal hypergraph wait a minute what are the nodes of a causal hypergraph are they events the tokens okay so that's not quite the same thing because what we've you know causal i actually think causality is usually about events what event caused what other event? That's the correct use of that term, I think. Sure. It makes it's... more sense to do it to the token-based hypergraph because then you don't extend hyperedges as you continue evolving the system. But once you do an event, it's done and it's not going to change anymore. But if you base the hypergraph on events instead, then with, as vertices then the hyper edges, which are tokens, would increase as you run, as you continue running the system. That sounds very interesting. Can I suggest that we think about this like this? Let's just write down a description of what I'm claiming the causal hypergraph is. And maybe you want to rename it the token event hypergraph, just to be extra, That's to be cool non-committal. Okay. Um, token event hypergraph. And let's write down the type signature of the hyper edges. It would be set arrow set that's what a hyper hyper edge looks like okay wait a minute this is a hyper edge it is set arrow set where that means those are sets of tokens yeah so you could even say I, set open bracket token close right, bracket these are it is mapping from sets of tokens to sets of tokens also for multi-history this would be multi-sets Yes, better to say multi-sets because a token can occur more than once. We don't want to force okay, the Okay, right, 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 right. From multi-sets of tokens to multi-sets of tokens. 
Are they ordered multi-sets? No. That would just be a list, right? Um, right. So these, so are unordered, these are unordered multi-sets, as a multi-set is. Yeah. But I wouldn't say mapping, because it what, what does that mean? It is a what mapping. Is well, it yeah. means it, because the, the way to interpret this is the event is a processing. The event is a function, basically. I mean, what this is, is, you know, usually in our system, functions take multiple arguments and return one value. This is a many-to-many -many function. The rule is a function. The event in, is an in, instanti instantiation of the function. Well, yes. Right. It's an instantiation of an orderless function. And by the way, it's that's another question. It's, could, it's, it can be non-deterministic as well. So that's just why I'm unhappy with mapping is because it just brings with it all kinds of baggage that you then have to modify. Like it's a non-deterministic mapping. And why is it non-deterministic? Because like a graph, if, if, if you, this mapping way of thinking about hypergraphs, we'll just apply it to a graph. You're claiming that a graph is a mapping from vertex to vertex. Well, it's not really. It's a relation between vertices and vertices because it's non, you know, it can be fan out. We have multiple events with the same inputs, but different. Yeah, outputs. okay, 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 okay. Mapping the transformation. Because that's what an event i.e. event. But the thing that I'm, I'm getting at here is in terms it's a re, of... It's a rewrite. I mean, quite literally... It's substitution, right. That came from a rewrite. Like, that's where that the hyper edge is. It represents an event. Yeah. It came from a particular rewrite that happened in a rewriting system. Yes. Well, so my question about this in terms of the language design of this is, is it obvious... These multisets, which we're taking to be unordered here, it's not obvious that they need to be unordered, is it? Or is it? Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe it doesn't really make a lot of sense to not have that. Um, the reason you want them to be unordered is because you don't care um, the order in which the input tokens got produced by prior events. Yeah, you're right. Because that's, that's just, you know, you don't care. The foliation comes after you build this token event. I don't event. think it has anything to do with order in which they produce. You could just have, you can have an event with, you know, labeled inputs. Okay, but, but, but I'm just trying to understand. So, so this token Essentially, event... so, so in other words, let's say you have an event that might produce different outputs based on the order in which it takes the tokens. So you might have two events that take both one, two, but depending on the order, it will give different outputs. And it's useful to store somewhere which order it was. So you're so saying Max can be ordered. What? Well, Max's point is that there's metadata around, if you think about where the rewrite came from, Max, please disagree with me if I'm getting this wrong, but I do remember we've had conversations about this. So like a rewrite, you know, if think of a rewrite as a pattern matching kind of deal, you know, like the left-hand mm -hmm. side matched and then changed something. And there can be sensitive details about how the patterns got bound such that just listing which tokens were involved doesn't uniquely determine the match, right? Like yeah. you could have... Yeah. Yeah, you could have X, Y, and Y, X can also match. And they both involve the same tokens as the left-hand side. So my, my claim would be that, yes, uh, you can try to store that metadata as well to sort of capture as much information about the behavior, the origin of this particular rewrite. But it, order is not even necessarily the only thing you need. There could be deeper right. structure that's involved in yeah. that match. I wouldn't load it all into order. I would say that the binding has a context that from the point right, which of could view, be the whole history of the system for all you, for all you know. The whole history of the system could affect that binding. It's an assumption. No, it's not about the history. It, it's, for example, let's say you have A triple underscore B triple underscore. And even for the same order, there are multiple ways to match that. Yes. So... My point would be just the observation how to factor up this problem mathematically is that when we get to the point of the token event hypergraph, 
um, I think we want something fairly uniform that just says for the point of view of causality, we just care about how, what tokens were required to be there for an event to happen. And there is other metadata present and we shouldn't ignore that, but I wouldn't suggest that we feel it has to be part of the token event hypergraph. Well, fair enough. But I mean, but, but the whole point here is there is, you know, there is a notion of partial ordering of events. Yes. That can be deduced from, so the token event hypergraph induces a partial ordering of events. Yes. Unless there's uh, cycles. So if you okay, start doing close like, time like curves, yeah, right. Yeah, like Max's event sets deliberately break that because it's just a nice way of. It's hard to explain exactly why event sets are. They're like deliberately not. No, I mean, that, that, <laughs> because, because the otherwise, otherwise there wouldn't be a universe. unique way to deduplicate the tokens. Yeah. Look. Event sets, okay, I would claim event sets are like the laws of physics as compared to the actual evolution graph, which is like the history of the universe. That's exactly well, the what rules I Well, the laws of physics. Well, event no. sets for me are like, they're kind of like the Hilbert space. Like there's more going on there. You can't have, you know... Um, Look, the, if it's, event it's, sets are like the observations, you know, is, are like the factored observations of the laws of physics. Well, the laws of physics apply to particular objects. But they don't, they still don't tell you what exactly happens. Like no, I, I know, but that, they're the, they tell you what would happen were you to have a this, that, or the other thing. They don't tell you whether you ever get this, that, or the other thing. Sure. Are they, only for one are, step. Are they observations or are they observables? I mean, there, they'd be observations if they were in some sort of reference frame. But can we speak about them as observations independently of that? No, not really. So can we just, is the term observable and okay? Yeah, I would not. I would not invoke any quantum mechanics things until we know. Yeah, I think that's even more confusing. Yeah. Factored, uh, uh, factored instances of the laws of physics, whatever that means. You know what it's. You know what it's like. It's like doing things that you know won't actually happen because it makes things so symmetrical that it makes the analysis much easier. And that's kind of like. And this is a very loose analogy, but it may prove to be more than an analogy. It's sort of like in Hilbert space, you can represent all possible, you know, entangled states as vectors, even if some of them in practice can't be constructed. I see what you're saying. So it's sort of like a backdrop that's more free than it needs to be. And then later in practice, right. you know, when you run the Petri net, that's when you observe that certain things couldn't have happened. Right. So it's the analog, it's the analog of you know, it's like a, you know, compare like a mapping on all of a space, a mapping defined on all of a space. But it might be that much of that space can never be reached. Um, another analogy would be sort of a fiber bundle where you can't make a global section of the fiber bundle, right? So. Right. It's a space in which all possibilities could exist, but in practice, you're never going to be able to, you know, there right. will be certain sets of tokens that just cannot be produced and they were kind of virtual. Right. What was your, your analogy? Like one of these, what is the, the term I'm now forgetting? The fiber bundle term you just used. The global section. So it's like. Oh, yeah. Fiber bundle uh, without a global section. Right, so it has non-trivial topology. Right, right. I mean, this is a, uh, you know, they're like like possibility, you know, possibility sets. Yeah. As opposed to actualized, you know, um, 
sort of theoretical possibility sets as opposed to things which have been actualized or which can be actualized. Yeah. Well, a Cayley graph would be a subset of that. Okay. What do you mean? That. Oh, I, I see, I see what you're saying. That a Cayley graph represents, if, if you're looking at, oh, wait a minute, the Cayley graph has been folded back in many, if you're looking at like words, you could imagine a thing where there are, if you think about a walk in a group, the Cayley graph represents all possible, all possible steps in a group, so to speak. But any particular walk in a group might not visit those things. See what I'm saying? I might, I might also make an analogy that sort of a group is forced to be, you can compose anything you like in a group, right? Even if, quote unquote, it doesn't make sense. There's no way for a group to express that something doesn't make sense. But that's what a groupoid can do. Like a groupoid can say, oh, certain things you can't compose. And that's more than an analogy. I think that's an accurate depiction of what the algebraic structures that will. Okay, so your, your claim is that this is the difference. The event set is like a group. And the actual evolution is like a groupoid. Yeah. That completes to that group in some sense, right? Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, okay, but but so so what's your point here? So the the point, I mean, what I was thinking would be interesting to do is just to start from the very simplest, you know, token event graph like things and just find out what they do. Gosh, where have we seen that methodology before? Um, and, uh, you know, that's what we were trying to do here is with finite, you know, with these finite sets, right? Then the token event hypergraph is always finite, right? If they're a finite set of rules, if they're a finite set of atoms, okay, we've got to distinguish a couple of things. Okay, what we've got are, you know, we've got rules versus rule schemas. Okay, so I'm claiming that explicit rules for a finite set of atoms are like rules, pattern rules, are like rule schemas. Does that make sense to you? So you would say in the AB string sorting thing, which by the way is a really good playground for dealing with, for actually making non-trivial examples for hyper token event hypergraphs and things. Um, AB goes to BA, that would be a rule. Exactly. Whereas if you had some blanks in there, that would be a rule schema. Is that the idea? Right. And, and like in the Wolf well, model. Wait stuff. a second. It, it is going to be a schema for A bigger to BA because you're not specifying the tokens. The, well, okay. A goes to BA is a weird if it case. was a rule uh, as you define it here, you would have to specify that for every position on the string. Correct. Yes, that's correct. So, so it's in fact wrong for strings. So just take that. Maybe we need a better name than rule versus rule schemas because because we already used rule to represent something. Well, which the rule and better. events. The rules and events. What do you call rules here? Are just events. No, I, I know, but then we've also got event schemas. I mean, you know, in in a Wolfram model, well, thing, the event schemas are rules. Yeah, I think Max is right. Like an event is a concrete match that happened. But and... it's not deduplicated. In other words, a, a given interaction between two atoms, or is it deduplicated? Let's see. At the token event graph level, it is deduplicated because the tokens are destroyed in the event. Hold on. They're both token event graphs. You're saying in the multi history, it's, or in, you know, in a normal non deduplicated multi history, there are more events. So I see what you're saying. So in an event set, you know, all similar possible, you know, instantiation events are the same thing. But yes. in the multi-history, they might appear in multiple places. That's correct. 
Uh, because so what, if, what we would need a name for is essentially the duplicated event or something like this. Right. In event class, maybe. Um, right, but so, so this is, event, yeah. it's not, I think events is very confusing. I mean, I think what we're talking about here is the difference between a, uh, you know, okay. One of the things that's difficult is, let's see. You, in one case, okay. One ca case one is there are, there is a finite set. Um, uh, of possible events in the sense that their token their token mapping is um uh let's see well i'm a little confused here but but i think the we need proper names yeah we need like base names otherwise because our words are already overloaded, so we can't use these words to define anything because they already mean several things. Right. So, I mean, the, the, okay, look, what we've got, we've got a, what we, we could call it a concrete, a concrete, an explicit event, a concrete event. So okay, that would that, be an event in a multi history. No, that, that's an event in which specifically named tokens, uh, in which certain well, specifically they're, named tokens occur. Well, they're always specifically named in an event. But can you well, give an example, Stephen? Like with the string. Oh okay, yeah, actually, I, I I would give it. Let me give a different one. Let me let me call this concrete rule an explicit rule. A concrete rule is a okay. A concrete rule is one in which explicit, specifically named tokens occur, like the rule, and and that's the example of that would be the rule. You know, two three goes to oh god no, this is so confusing because in the Wolf so model instead stuff, of so instead of it, doing an event set, you want to call it an explicit rule set. Is that what you're saying? I don't know. I'm not sure about that at that level. But what I'm trying to define here is let's let's call this let, let's talk about this case here. Okay. Let's say A B goes to you know C D or something. Okay. That would be something where we, we know we're not imagining that those are patterns at all, as opposed to something that's more of the form X blank, Y blank. You know, goes to whatever. And to be clear, that those strings there, um, a string rewriting system is a bit of a problem because um, the the token A actually is both the letter I and know. the position. Right? I know that. I know that. I know that. Actually, the, the Dan Dane whatever suggests verbatim rule, which is not a bad name. But but when you what you wrote below, the A B goes to C D. You referring to you're not, you're I'm not, not doing it. it well. I'm not doing this well because I'm just using those as to as as symbolic tokens in some sense. I, I don't really want to think about strings. Global identifiers. Those are global identifiers. Of yes, tokens. Yeah. that's correct. Okay, so that yes, yes, right. So there's the, where where those. Okay, but so now. Um, what was I going to ask? Uh, Tico instance of a rule. Yes, that's right. Instantiated the rule. Yeah, rule instance or something. Yeah. But except that that's a, I mean, instantiate, the problem is we might, we might, um, uh, See, that's not quite right because it might actually be in, in the things we were doing up here, those rules were that way. You see what I'm saying? 
that it wasn't it wasn't we weren't instantiating anything we were it was a rule that no, the instantiation was, was trivial I, I know that but that's confusing if you make it but like it's that. still an instantiation it I know, but a verbatim rule is a good name because that I think that's the better best of these names because I think that suggests that it is a rule for concrete things, so to speak. Yeah. Right, as opposed to a rule for pattern things. Can I so, suggest that we also then say that once we have a verbatim rule that can yield a verbatim rewrite? Yeah, exactly. Right. Right, the verbatim rule yields. Uh, and you might also call that a verbatim event. Exactly, rewrite verbatim event. rewrite, uh, AKA, a, AKA a verbatim event. As opposed to an event of a class. Wait, what's your verbatim in it? It's got concrete tokens coming in and going out. But I mean, uh, can there be a not verbatim rewrite? Yeah, I think there could be. So a deduplicated um, rewrite or event is, in some sense, an equivalence class of verbatim events. They're atomic events, right? Like we just want to distinguish the simple case from the weirder cases where we've got event sets and whatnot. But I think verbatim means that it's not a pattern. Yes, that's right. But that's in the I case mean. of a rewrite, there are no patterns either way. It's not about okay. patterns. Well, then maybe we should say it yields an atomic rewrite or something like that. Uh, that's not a good word. Um, yeah, it's, primitive rewrite. I don't get why we have to define. I mean, these. Okay, hold on. In, in the basic idea. <laughs> Look, the basic idea here is in a finite set of tokens, in a system of a finite set of tokens and a finite set of events, I mean, the thing we were considering above, you know, consider a case with a finite number of possible tokens and a finite number of possible events, a finite number of possible concrete events. Okay, that was the case we were looking at above. Now, that a, a, a counter case is like a Wolfram model thing where there are an infinite number of possible atoms, so an infinite number of possible tokens, and an infinite number of possible concrete events, because those concrete events can involve hyperedges with all kinds of random, you know, uh, atom number 10 to the 100 or something, if that makes sense. Which is very different from the case where, where you know, the number of tokens is finite and the number of 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 concrete events is finite. Well, maybe I can muddy the waters by pointing out that even with finite number of tokens and a finite number of these verbatim rules, you can still get multiple copies of the same token because you could have yes, a, you can. Right. And then you can have B goes to A, and now you have right. two A's. Crucial right? assumption. Okay, crucial assumption. A token in multi-history, right, can be consumed any number of times. Um, do you mistaken. mean... Well, wait, I'm not so sure about that. Um, the two routes you could take. One is you could say um, a token's never consumed, right? That was actually Max's original... I think you call them match all systems, right? Another thing you can say is that tokens have explicit That's multiplicity. Actually, match all system is essentially the same as an event set. Okay. It's not deduplicated. Okay. It wasn't. But you could, the other option you can say is that no, um, they do get consumed, but they have a multiplicity. So in any given history, like in any given concrete set of rewritings, you can make multiple A's and you can use them up and they can eventually run out. You just track the multiplicity of, of each, you know, each of these uh, concrete tokens. Okay, the, I believe that that is more like a Petri net in which you are, in which you have a certain, uh, what is it? I, I think Jonathan had a name for capacitated multi-way systems or something. 
for these things where there are finite number of possible instances of something. I, I think Stephen is talking about simple things here because these are multi histories. So in multi history, I mean, assuming non deduplicated one, you know, multiple tokens are just different. And in that case, in a single history, they can only be consumed once, but multi history, they can be consumed multiple times. So it's a max destroy events parameter, essentially. Yeah, but I'm referring to something different. I'm saying even within a single history, you can get several A's, right? Now, you might say, let's not do that, but that makes things way more complicated because then you'd have to prove that if you've got the situation I described where B goes to A, A goes to B, whatever, and you have some, you've got one A and one B. If you run B goes to A under that circumstances, you now have two A's. Like, how, so, how, do you, how do you prevent that from happening, right? Like, you have two A's now. That's, there are two why A's. Why do you prevent it from happening? I don't understand. You can't, because, I mean, That's to why prevent it from happening systems. requires foliations and all kinds of things like that. The thing is just going to, I mean, that I think is a, you know, is a core feature of these multi-computational things is that they, they just. That's a core feature of the multi-set substitution system, which is why it's called a multi-set system. But then, so Max, do you, do you think that those two A's are actually different tokens? Is that how you. Yeah. That? In a non-deduplicated multi-history. Yeah. Okay, I, I think I might disagree. And you with cannot you. deduplicate them because then you cannot do it uniquely. That's the whole point. If you if you start to deduplicate them, then you go all the way to the event set. I couldn't find yes. any kind of intermediate way. Right, but but look, look, deduplication is an observer story. Deduplication is otherwise known as equivalence classes, is otherwise known as reference frames, is otherwise known as you know many other things, right? Deduplication. I know what isn't, does it have to do with reference or frames? I'll tell you what it has to do with them. It, the the whole point is that making a reference frame is making some or making some way that an observer samples something is an equivalence class is defining a set of equivalence classes. So one equivalence class you can set up is every instance of the same, you know, uh, event, for example, is deduplicated. That's a, in a sense, what that's doing is it's saying, okay, here's what that's doing. It's kind of an interesting way to think about it. The, the observer of the universe can say in a very Chaitin-esque way in some sense, I don't care about the whole unrolling of the universe. I'm simply going to summarize the universe by its rules. Do you see what I'm saying? And in a sense, that's the ultimate deduplication of the universe. It's like, I don't care what it actually did. I just need to know its rules. Yeah. The, um, so the point is, so when you have this verbatim rule, and A is in, you know, between these quotation marks, you can have a multiplicity of A. But the point is that, and so you have a multiplicity of A, and if you perform an observation, there's some equivalence classes amongst A's, right? But there's no equivalence between A and, and anything else. It's not generalizing. We're just talking about um, when, we're, when we have this verbatim rule, there's still this concreteness to it, even though there might be a multiplicity of these particular quoted, I don't know what you want to call them, tokens. Well, it sounds like Max is saying that um, you can't do multiplicities without running into non, like non-uniqueness issues. I agree. I agree. Yes, I'm I not, agree. No, I, I, I'm not, I don't, that's, that's not clear to me. Okay, but I'm I'm saying to you that's going to end up being an observer story. Oh, I, I don't have which proof of that. What's that? I I don't have a proof of that. I know, but 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 but. But I did think of it for multiple months, and I couldn't manage to come up with it. In okay, sense. I think that it is almost. I think it's extremely likely to be the case, and it probably depends on the system. There may be a natural way to partially deduplicate for some systems, but. I think the two cases are you either look at what the universe does or you look at the rules for the universe. And the intermediate case. Not the is, rules, the events. No, the deduplicated. Well, you're buying some rules. Right. You call them. No, it's the 
Well, whatever. Whether it's schemas or that, that's less important. But the, the main well, point is... three levels. You, you just have original rules. Then you have this verbatim rules, the event set. And then you have a multi-history. Yes. Um, I maintain my idea that my point of view that if you, all you're doing is multiplicity of these kind of concrete tokens, that Max is like Max. The problems that you saw. Well, what do you think about these multiplicities? Is that multiple tokens that you have might have different separations to other tokens in the multi history? So it's not enough to just say, well, we have three A's, because one of these A's might be space like with a C, and another one is branch like. And you need to store it in some way. Yes, but I mean, but look, the way that you're slicing this question of deduplicating is imagine that it is in a particular slice of a foliation, particular transversal or whatever. Is that the right name for the slice of a foliation? Um, anyway, but, but you know, in a particular slice. Leaf. I think they're called leaves. Right. Okay. Okay. So in a particular leaf, slice, whatever, we're saying that you can deduplicate within a slice. The question is, you can have a global thing where you deduplicate everywhere, or you can define something which it probably has some partial order requirements that you deduplicate only within that slice. Yeah, that's I, what, I suppose that, that's what I was thinking of. And Max is pointing out that you could do that maybe in a slice, but you're not gonna be able to do that globally. And I see what he means and I agree. Right, but you, but you could imagine a collection of slices, right? You could have, you know, a partial deduplication. Look, there's some very specific cases where you can do the duplication. Yeah, I'm sure. Like for example, in a system that just adds numbers, uh, you know, and it adds pairs of numbers, you can deduplicate everything. But what I'm saying is that if you try to do it in general, you end up in a situation where you you maybe you can deduplicate, but there are multiple ways to do it. So you have, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. parameterization problem. There's no normal form, yeah. Right, yeah. but th this is the story of reference frames. I mean, yeah, this that's is- okay, right. Right, I mean, the fact is, okay, so pulling this back to sort of the, the, the language design- I don't design think it has anything with reference frame because it's- It does. Well, I don't know. It's reference it frames might. exist even in single histories. That that's that, but they they exist in single histories because they are a space like scar of branch like separation. What the way I see it, in single histories there is no branch like separation at all. I know they are. I, that's what I said. They're a space like scar of branch like separation. What do I mean by that? Consider the evaluation of the Fibonacci series. Okay, the those. The, the, the two branches, you know, the f of n minus one, f of n minus two, you can think of those as being space-like separated things in some sense. But you can also think of them, if you wanted to, hmm. as being, you know, branch-like. You could do one or you could do the other. And Wait then, a second. If you're saying they're space-like separated, that means you have a state with multiple tokens in it. So what would it be in that case? Multiple numbers. I mean, it, it is the Fibonacci tree. Right, And the point is that the Fibonacci tree, so look, the, the way to think about this, I think, is that in the Fibonacci tree, okay, space-like separation, what am I trying to say? One thing you I think we do, need to write it down as a multi-set substitution system explicitly, otherwise we don't understand what the system is. Okay, the system is f of n goes to f of n minus one. Look, we can write it out going to run out of time here unfortunately but but um uh where is it we had are we using your technology here or are we using my technology we can use my technology it'll be easier um okay so let's say fibonacci here okay so that would simply be f of n goes to f of n minus 1, f of n minus 2. Okay, and we started off with 6. Look, 
uh, I want to start off with f of five, for example, here. f of five. Okay, and now we want to also have the rule in here, which I think I can do, that says f of one goes to one. Oops, that's not what I want to do. F of one goes to one. I think I can just do that. F of two, or do I need to put it in a list? I might need to put it in a list. F of two goes to one. Am I confused here? F of one goes to one. F of two goes to one. Why am I having a sublist there? Don't need a sublist there. Like that. Oh gosh, what did I do wrong here? F of one goes to one. Oh, now you've got it. Um, oh, never mind. What the heck did I do wrong here? Well, let's ignore the end condition for a minute. But try just the same kind of rules. Oh, you mean, you mean, I see what you're saying. Okay. The base case is not going to do anything interesting. Let's add two extra edges at the end. So who cares about that? Well, I know, but it, it, I'm, I'm, I want to make something where I can just run this for, for, for four steps and it won't go crazy. Okay, so that's going it a little... It will go crazy because the third rule still works. Just to don't... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay. Fine, but my point about this was when it wasn't going crazy, okay, that um, if I say f of f of seven or something here, um, you can put a condition on the f of n and to say condition n greater. Oh than yeah, n. yeah, right. That's an obvious Zero. thing. To, right, it's an obvious thing to do. Okay, so let's get rid of all of that, and then here. Why is there an f of minus one? Uh, greater n greater than two. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so now the claim is that this object, I'm actually now totally confused about what happened here. This has a bunch of deduplication. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 right, 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 right. This is unique tokens goes to false. So this is a very bad computation of Fibonacci. This, on the other hand, is a good computation of Fibonacci. Okay, so in the case of evaluating Fibonacci, our, what am I trying to say? What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that these are... No, other way around. The one you just ran is a bad one because F of four got run multiple times. Well, I know that, I know that, I know that. But I'm, I'm saying good, bad, right. It depends on what you're doing. If you're, if you're just, in this one, if we tracked values, we could get a good one. But mm. right. Well, if you, you duplicate the multi history, you kind of you lose information about separation. Yes, right. If you deduplicate so the one it, on the bottom is more clear. Right. Yeah, but, okay. And the one on the top doesn't contain its weightings. It doesn't contain the path weights. If it did contain the path weights, it would work. But it's not just the path weights. It also doesn't contain separations, which is more important. Okay. But my basic claim is that oh boy i mean yeah, the thing here is everything is space like or time like yeah i mean where's the scope the only scope for branch like is if there's non-determinism right if you right. could have used a token in more than one way that's the only place branching happens well i mean this is rather trivial okay what am i trying to say with with um Look, if I can make make a different claim about reference frames, because I think reference frames are involved, it would be that reference frames for a single history, that's special relativity. Reference frames for multi-history, that's special relativity and quantum mechanics together. Yes. I mean, aspirationally, right? We don't, we can't prove that yet, but that's what we believe. Right. 
Well, okay. We need to wrap up, unfortunately, but but let me just throw out one last thing here. Okay. So, you know, what we've got here is a I mean, we've also got the sort of language design problem of how do we deal with the many to many function thing where okay, you know, our normal evaluator just picks a single history and evol evolves to a fixed point. This is a different form of evaluation where we probably aren't evolving to a fixed point, but we certainly aren't evolving to a single fixed point. Like in this case here, in this case here, what we want to do for evaluation is vacuum up, so to speak, all of the leaves and count them, right? which is a very different operation than our normal evaluator. If we thought about this, you know, this is an example of an evaluation process, but it is a multi, uh, you know, a multi outcome evaluation process in which the observer is going to be a, an observer that counts leaves, as opposed to if this was another kind of problem, like a logic programming type problem, where the observer is trying to find the winning path, so to speak, or a theorem proving problem, right? The observer will be trying to find a winning path here. And to our knowledge right now, we don't know the significance of, let's say, well, in theorem proving, it depends on which way around we do it. But if we do the, you know, if we do theorem proving, where you're treeing out, can you get to true, for example, as opposed to reduction, can you reduce to true? If you're doing the treeing out to true, the question of how many different ways there are to get to true is, mm. I don't think anybody knows the significance of that, proof-wise. Mm. Mm. Right? I mean, in the case of Fibonacci, we are, you know, we think we know the significance of the number of paths. You know, that's this is, you know, in probabilistic programming, we know the significance of the number of paths. It's a weighting. In the case of, of theorem proving, I do not think we know the significance of the number of paths. Um, for this Fibonacci system, which is interesting to me, um, I haven't looked at this. Do, we, do you know what the weights are? Like, what, what's the combinatorics of this? What do you mean by that? I mean, like, if you if you computed path weights and so on, um, well, I think this one is kind of trivial. I think this one is just ones, but I think I think it gets more complicated when you have things like this. No, oh, but there is mm. a question: is how many ways to get the f of one, for example, in any of them? So basically, how many f of one are in this graph? And you know, the same. Yes, that's, that's, yeah, that's there might be some really interesting number theory. I just assumed you were reaching for this because you'd already well understood what this did in terms of weights and so on but is that unknown no now? it's it's not i mean not really known to me i think that this is look there's a whole breadth first i mean this is the thing tally that i've been circling for like 40 years about all these evaluation you know all this business about different evaluation schemes i mean the question of different evaluation schemes for recursive evaluation is a reference frame question you know breadth first search depth first search these are two different ways of sampling the space yeah. And what we don't have, and what I think is a big language design challenge, is a parameterization of those sampling methods, which I mean, at present we don't care yeah. about. Well, it's fascinating because it's like breadth first and depth first. You can imagine depth first is sort of like you traveling at the speed of light, right? Yeah, that's right. And breadth first is you traveling at the slowest possible speed. And the natural thing is, I mean, it, maybe it's hard to parameterize for like some weird abstract system where you don't have any Yeah, it's state. what the initial frames are for different boosts. Yeah, what's that group? I mean, that's really fascinating. And how would you sample meaningfully, meaning, specify it and sample from it meaningfully? Because that might be a very useful thing in general to be able to... Well, you know. look, another way to think about it, Tally, is this is a way each one of those things is a total order. What you've defined as a partial order, what you're interested in is how do you find out, how do you... What are the boosts between partial, between total orders? Mm. In other words, because many total orders are a total mess, right? I mean, I had some examples in the in the um, uh, you know in the thing I wrote um, of total orders that you can get. Right? I mean, this was the um, uh, here. I'll just pull this up and then we the um, yes, this is. All quite fascinating, I think, and I think I think the end result of this, you know, fascination, so to speak, is going to be a very, very interesting language design for doing distributed computing. 
That is what I think. Um, which is going to end up also being the raw material that one uses to do all these multi-computational models of random things like immunology and so on. They're all going to be, you know, just like one can use cellular automata to make models of certain sort of spatially and temporally discrete, you know, things. This is, but one needs the underlying, you know, I don't know, let me, wait. I was just, just, um, let me see. This is, this is the right one. Um, I'm also just super fascinated, just from a mathematical point of view, um, like, and I think I've said this before somewhere or other, what is the Lorentz group for these kind of discrete systems? And like, it's obviously not a group, yes. a groupoid. Well, right. So, so the, okay. So these are examples of total orderings, right? So this is this this will be a this will be a good case to look at. In your AB goes to BA is a good test test system. This is the AB goes to BA causal graph, right? Yeah. And each one of these is a possible. That's essentially breadth first search. That's essentially depth first search. Right. And, and this is a messy one. So the question is, okay, so I, I think the exercise here, which I agree is a really interesting exercise, is how do you get from, you know, what is the, the, the space of parameterized things from breadth first to depth first, knowing that there's mess in between, right? In other words, if this is an inertial frame, and this is maybe another light-like inertial frame or something, what is the you know, what is the boost of, of, of breadth first search? Yeah. And is there some scheme generalizing from that, presuming you can solve it? Is there some scheme that just works for any rewrite system that will give you a way of building its, you know. Yes, I understand. Of building its frames. Group. Yeah, right. Yeah, its frames. Yes, that's a very interesting question. Because, I mean, obviously, in this, this graph, you know, this happens to be just space-like separated. We could also have branch-like separated things here. Um, and, uh, and then that, that challenge becomes, essentially, how do you build the Hilbert space for an arbitrary rewrite system? Like, what's the automatic way of doing it, which we would very much want? Yes, I agree. I agree. I agree. Because if we could do that, that is a... Why are you referring to this as the Hilbert space for that? You're saying, I mean, it's essentially a coordinatization of, yeah, I see what you're saying. You, you mean, what is the coordinate, what is the, how do you coordinatize um, the, the, the possible total orders? Which right now are just messy like this. How would you enumerate? I, I don't even remember how we did this one. Ed, did you have yeah, this? Oh, yeah, this um, is Young Tableau. Right, I remember this. Yeah, th this is actually very relevant, Tally. This is, this is probably how to do it. Hmm. Yes. Yes, I did. Right, so, so um, do, hmm. do, you see, do you see this? Th this, is the, this is the key thing. And by the way, how Young Tableau have this whole relation to irreducible representations of groups. And the algebras, yeah. There's, um, there's a fascinating story here, which is that um, I'm, I'm actually writing this up, so I won't be able to say more than just a high-level description of what the idea is, but the idea is that um, coarse grainings, which are equivalence classes, right? Mm -hmm. And it's related to Max's deduplication story, um, actually amount in quiver geometry to coverings of certain quivers by other quivers. And it turns out that those are related to irreducible representations that generate the corresponding quivers. Makes sense. So that's interesting because the way that you, you know, you, you can reduce a particular complicated um, quiver into all of these little simple, simpler sub quivers that are related by covering relationships amounts to building this modular lattice that is the lattice of sub-representations of the original quiver in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. This is why I like combinatorics because there's always a connection to something else. <laughs> yeah. I just want to see Tally finish one write-up. 
Tally, we're, we're all rooting for you writing, finishing writing these things up. Well, you can, there's a website that's got a bunch of stuff that I've already done. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's weird. I, I don't you, and make a big deal out of it because it's never actually done. So there's no particular moment to announce can you, it. Can you tell us where it is? Sure. It's quivergeometry.net. You should at least let us link to it from the physics project. So that... Well, I was thinking it might be nice to try to package up some of that stuff into a, into like a bulletin. That would be great. Well, this looks lovely. I did not know this existed. Hmm. Well, this is going to wind up as a book, Tally. I suppose it already, in a way, it already is like a 21st century book is a website. I don't. I know, but you could also print it just for fun. That's true. Um, by the way, click on cover covers because that's the point that I was trying to make. So um, if you scroll down a little bit, so covers have this very interesting lattice. Um, and the way that you accomplish covers is by obviously gluing vertices and edges together. So that's an example of one of the lattices that you get from just a graph, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's a quiver rather than a graph, and by quiver, I mean my cardinal quivers, which are these restrictive quivers. Then if you scroll down a little bit more, you'll see that it's, you can't do certain coverings because they violate the property of being a quiver. So it collapses the, the lattice quite a bit there. And what that means is that, um, just, just scroll up a tiny bit. Okay, okay. I think I'm understanding, but this is very nice. This looks very nice. The, so I, I unfortunately really have to go to some much less interesting meeting. Um, okay. The, well, um, maybe, maybe we could continue next week if people are around. Um, yeah. That would be, and, uh, and Tally, for goodness sake, you've got to expose this. This looks really quite lovely. Really quite lovely. Thanks. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I'm actually really excited to see this. The, um, uh, all right, we should wrap up for now. So uh, we made, uh, you know, but I agree, Tally, that this is this is the nub of this. Uh, uh, I, I've been trying to figure out what is the the kind of the core question that is the parameterization of observers, and it's basically this question of, you know, how do you how do you parameterize total orders out of partial orders? I yeah, think. yeah, and that that the young tableaus is very interesting to see there because it's obviously got a lot to do with Lie groups, Lie algebras, and that kind of thing, and representation theory. And just to the claim that I just made is that that lattice that you see there, those are sub representations in a very precise sense, and the ones that are closest, the bottom one, that bottom covering, that's the trivial representation. The top mm -hmm. graph, that's the faithful representation, the thing itself. Right, and that's probably related to these young tableau, which also have some kind of hierarchy and, and partial order relations like this. Yeah, anyway, exactly. To, yes, this is lovely, and I, but I need to go to something else. Should um, we set the, should this be the, the agenda for the next meeting? Should we just continue yes. where we left off? Yes, okay. yes. I can write that. Yeah, yeah, I'll write that down. No problem. Okay, thank you all very much. This is very interesting, and thanks to folks on the live stream, and we'll see you another time. Oh, okay.